This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Gesine. Dear Enemy by Jean Webster. Part 4. March 13th. Mrs. Judy Abbott Pendleton. Dear Madam, your four letters, two telegrams, and three checks are at hand, and your instructions shall be obeyed just as quickly as this overworked superintendent can manage it. I delegated the dining-room job to Betsy Kindred. One hundred dollars did I allow her for the rehabilitation of that dreary apartment. She accepted the trust, picked out five likely orphans to assist in the mechanical details, and closed the door. For three days the children have been eating from the desks in the schoolroom. I haven't an idea what Betsy is doing, but she has a lot better taste than I, so there isn't much use in interfering. It is such a heaven-sent relief to be able to leave something to somebody else, and be sure it will be carried out. With all due respect to the age and experience of the staff I found here, they are not very open to new ideas. As the John Greer home was planned by its noble founder in 1875, so shall it be run to-day. Incidentally, my dear Judy, your idea of a private dining-room for the superintendent, which I, being a social soul, at first scorned, has been my salvation. When I am dead tired I dine alone, but in my live intervals I invite an officer to share the meal, and in the expansive intimacy of the dinner-table I get in the most effective strokes. When it becomes desirable to plant the seeds of fresh air into the soul of Miss Snaith, I invite her to dinner, and tactfully sandwich in a little oxygen between her slices of pressed veal. Pressed veal is our cook's idea of an acceptable pièce de résistance for a dinner party. In another month I am going to face the subject of suitable nourishment for the executive staff. Meanwhile there are so many things more important than our own comfort that we shall have to worry along on veal. A terrible bumping has just occurred outside my door, one little cherub seems to be kicking another little cherub downstairs. But I write on undisturbed. If I am to spend my days among orphans, I must cultivate a cheerful detachment. Did you get Leonora Fenton's cards? She is marrying a medical missionary and going to Siam to live. Did you ever hear of anything so absurd as Leonora presiding over a missionary's menage? Do you suppose she will entertain the heathen with skirt dances? It isn't any absurder, though, than me in an orphan asylum, or you as a conservative settled matron, or Marty Keene as social butterfly in Paris. Do you suppose she goes to embassy balls in riding clothes? And what on earth does she do about hair? It couldn't have grown so soon. She must wear a wig. Isn't our class turning out some hilarious surprises? The mail arrives. Excuse me while I read a nice fat letter from Washington. Not so nice. Quite impertinent. Gordon can't get over the idea that it is a joke. S. McBee, in conjunction with 113 orphans. But he wouldn't think it such a joke if he could try it for a few days. He says he is going to drop off here, on his next trip north, and watch the struggle. How would it be if I left him in charge while I dashed to New York to accomplish some shopping? Our sheets are all worn out and we haven't more than two hundred and eleven blankets in the house. Singapore, sole puppy of my heart and home, sends his respectful love. I also, S. McBee. John Greer Home, Friday. My dearest Judy, you should see what your hundred dollars and Betsy Kindred did to that dining-room. It's a dazzling dream of yellow paint. Being a north room, she sought to brighten it, and she has. The walls are calcimine buff, with a frieze of little molly cottontails scurrying around the top. All of the woodwork, tables and benches included, is a cheerful chrome yellow. Instead of tablecloths, which we can't afford, we have linen runners, with stenciled rabbits hopping along their length. Also yellow bowls, filled at present with pussy willows, but looking forward to dandelions and cowslips and buttercups. And new dishes, my dear, white, with yellow jonquils, we think, though there may be roses. There is no botany expert in the house. 
Most wonderful touch of all, we have napkins, the first we have seen in our whole lives. The children thought they were handkerchiefs, and ecstatically wiped their noses. To honor the opening of the new room, we had ice cream and cake for dessert. It is such a pleasure to see these children anything but cowed and apathetic, that I am offering prizes for boisterousness. To every one but Sadie Kate. She drummed on the table with her knife and fork and sang, Welcome to them golden halls. You remember that illuminated text over the dining room door, The Lord will provide. We've painted it out and covered the spot with rabbits. It's all very well to teach so easy a belief to normal children, who have a proper family and roof behind them. But a person whose only refuge in distress will be a park bench must learn a more militant creed than that. The Lord has given you two hands and a brain and a big world to use them in. Use them well and you will be provided for. Use them ill and you will want, is our motto, and that with reservations. In the sorting process that has been going on, I have got rid of eleven children. That blessed State Charities Aid Association helped me dispose of three little girls, all placed in very nice homes, and one to be adopted legally if the family likes her. And the family will like her, I saw to that. She was the prized child of the institution, obedient and polite, with curly hair and affectionate ways, exactly the little girl that every family needs. When a couple of adopting parents are choosing a daughter, I stand by with my heart in my mouth, feeling as though I were assisting in the inscrutable designs of fate. Such a little thing turns the balance. The child smiles, and a loving home is hers for life. She sneezes, and it passes her by forever. Three of our biggest boys have gone to work on farms, one of them out west to a ranch. Report has it that he is to become a cowboy and Indian fighter and grizzly bear hunter, though I believe in reality he is to engage in the pastoral work of harvesting wheat. He marched off, a hero of romance, followed by the wistful eyes of twenty-five adventurous lads, who turned back with a sigh to the safely monotonous life of the J.G.H. Five other children have been sent to their proper institutions. One of them is deaf, one an epileptic, and the other three approaching idiocy. None of them ought ever to have been accepted here. This is an educational institution, and we can't waste our valuable plant in caring for defectives. Orphan asylums seem to have gone out of style. What I am going to develop is a boarding school for the physical, moral, and mental growth of children whose parents have not been able to provide for their care. Orphans is merely my generic term for the children. A good many of them are not orphans in the least. They have one troublesome and tenacious parent left, who won't sign a surrender, so I can't place them out for adoption. But those that are available would be far better off in loving foster homes than in the best institution that I can ever make. So I am fitting them for adoption as quickly as possible, and searching for the homes. You ought to run across a lot of pleasant families in your travels. Can't you bully some of them into adopting children? Boys by preference. We've got an awful lot of extra boys, and nobody wants them. Talk about anti-feminism. It's nothing to the anti-masculinism that exists in the breasts of adopting parents. I could place out a thousand dimpled little girls with yellow hair, but a good live boy from nine to thirteen is a drug on the market. There seems to be a general feeling that they track in dirt and scratch up mahogany furniture. Shouldn't you think that men's clubs might like to adopt boys as a sort of mascot? The boy could be boarded in a nice, respectable family and drawn out by the different members on Saturday afternoons. They could take him to ball games and the circus, and then return him when they had had enough, just as you do with your library book. It would be very valuable training for the bachelors. People are forever talking about the desirability of training girls for motherhood. Why not institute a course of training in fatherhood? and get the best men's clubs to take it up. Would you please have Jervis agitate the matter at his various clubs, and I'll have Gordon start the idea in Washington. They both belong to such a lot of clubs that we ought to dispose of at least a dozen boys. I remain the ever-distracted mother of 113. S. McBee The John Greer Home, March 18th Dear Judy, I have been having a pleasant respite, 
from the one hundred and thirteen cares of motherhood. Yesterday who should drop down upon our peaceful village but Mr. Gordon Hallock, on his way back to Washington to resume the cares of the nation. At least he said it was on his way, but I noticed from the map in the primary room that it was one hundred miles out of his way. And dear, but I was glad to see him. He is the first glimpse of the outside world I have had since I was incarcerated in this asylum. And such a lot of entertaining businesses he had to talk about. He knows the inside of all the outside things you read in the newspapers. So far as I can make out, he is the social centre about which Washington revolves. I always knew he would get on in politics, for he has a way with him. There's no doubt about it. You can't imagine how exhilarated and set up I feel, as though I'd come into my own again after a period of social ostracism. I must confess that I get lonely for someone who talks my kind of nonsensical talk. Betsy trots off home every weekend, and the doctor is conversational enough, but oh, so horribly logical. Gordon somehow seems to stand for the life I belong to, of country clubs and motors and dancing and sport and politeness. A poor, foolish, silly life, if you will, but my own, and I have missed it. This serving society business is theoretically admirable and compelling and interesting, but deadly stupid in its working details. I am afraid I was never born to set the crooked straight. I tried to show Gordon about and make him take an interest in the babies, but he wouldn't glance at them. He thinks I came just to spite him. Which, of course, I did. Your siren call would never have lured me from my path of frivolity had Gordon not been so unpleasantly hilarious at the idea of my being able to manage an orphan asylum. I came here to show him that I could, and now, when I can show him, the beast refuses to look. I invited him to dinner with a warning about the pressed veal, but he said no thanks that I needed a change. So we went to Brantwood Inn and had broiled lobster. I had positively forgotten that the creatures were edible. This morning at seven o'clock I was wakened by the furious ringing of the telephone bell. It was Gordon at the station, about to resume his journey to Washington. He was in quite a contrite mood about the asylum, and apologized largely for refusing to look at my children. It was not that he didn't like orphans, he said. It was just that he didn't like them in juxtaposition to me. And to prove his good intentions, he would send them a bag of peanuts. I feel as fresh and revivified after my little fling as though I'd had a real vacation. There's no doubt about it. An hour or so of exciting talk is more of a tonic to me than a pint of iron and strychnine pills. You owe me two letters, dear madame. Pay them to sweet, or I lay down my pen forever. Yours as usual, S. McB. Tuesday, 5 p.m. My dear enemy, I am told that during my absence this afternoon you paid us a call and dug up a scandal. You claim that the children under Miss Snaith are not receiving their due in the matter of cod liver royal. I am sorry if your medicinal orders have not been carried out, but you must know that it is a difficult matter to introduce that abominably smelling stuff into the inside of a squirming child. And poor Mrs. Snaith is a very much overworked person. She has ten more children to care for than should rightly fall into the lot of any single woman, and until we find her another assistant, she has very little time for the fancy touches you demand. Also, my dear enemy, she is very susceptible to abuse. When you feel in a fighting mood, I wish you would expend your belligerence upon me. I don't mind it, quite the contrary. But that poor lady has retired to her room in a state of hysterics, leaving nine babies to be tucked into bed by whomever it may concern. If you have any powders that would be settling to her nerves, please send them back by Sadie Kate. Yours truly, S. McBride. Wednesday morning. Dear Dr. McRae, I am not taking an unintelligent stand in the least. I am simply asking that you come to me with all complaints and not stir up my staff in any such volcanic fashion as that of yesterday. I endeavour to carry out all of your orders, of a medical nature, with scrupulous care. In the present case there seems to have been some negligence. I don't know what did become of those fourteen unadministered bottles 
of cod liver oil that you have made such a fuss about, but I shall investigate. And I cannot, for various reasons, pack off Miss Snaith in the summary fashion you demand. She may be in certain respects inefficient, but she is kind to the children, and with supervision will answer temporarily. Yours truly, S. McBride End of Part 4 Recorded by Gazina in October 2007